Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to take a look at this, the Raspberry Pi Pico, along with a little tin of a Raspberry Pi Pico accessories that I got to use with the board. And the Raspberry Pi Pico, what it is, is the first microcontroller to be launched by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. The Raspberry Pi Pico is not a computer, it's a microcontroller. And therefore, in this video, the first thing we have to do is to explain the differences between a computer and a microcontroller, between the Pico and other Raspberry Pi boards, and then, of course, we'll get the Pico up and running. So, with all that explained, let's go and take a closer look. Right. Here we have our Raspberry Pi Pico, which has an official price of $4, and which I purchased for £3.60 here in the UK. So, let's release it from its little bag. There we are, tiny little thing, the Raspberry Pi Pico, and here's the accessory tin I also purchased to use with the board. Another shiny tin, get inside here, there we are, all bit of foam, and in here there's various things, there's a USB lead, there's various headers, which we'll be using later in the video. But I said I'd start out by explaining the differences between a microcontroller like the Raspberry Pi Pico and a computer. So let's take the Raspberry Pi Pico and put it down over here next to a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a $5 general purpose computer. So other than the physical size, what are the key differences? Well, a microcontroller like a Raspberry Pi Pico or an Arduino is a programmable device for controlling other electronic components. Microcontrollers are loaded with a program for undertaking a specific task, and therefore they don't need to run an operating system, or to have lots of RAM or lots of storage, or to have connectors for traditional computing peripherals like a monitor or a keyboard. So, if we compare the Pi Pico to the Pi Zero, we see that the Pi Zero has got mass storage on a microSD card, it's got an HDMI connector for connecting a monitor, it's got a micro USB connector for powering the board, but also a second micro USB connector for connecting a keyboard or other USB peripherals. The Pi Zero also runs an operating system, most obviously Raspberry Pi OS, and this allows the Pi Zero, a computer, to be used for high-end computing applications. In contrast, the Raspberry Pi Pico has got a single micro USB connector for powering the board and for transferring programs to it from a computer. And it communicates with other electronic devices using its general purpose input output connectors here on either side of the board. What all of this means is if you want to run end user applications or you want to do complex memory intensive computing tasks like recording or playing video, then you need a computer like a Raspberry Pi Zero. However, if you want to use a dedicated piece of code to control electronic components and to do so in a very power efficient fashion, then a microcontroller like the Raspberry Pi Pico is a far better choice. The Pi Pico has also got analog input, which we don't find on other Raspberry Pi models, and it also offers much better low latency GPIO control. The Raspberry Pi Pico is a mere 51 by 21 millimeters in size, and at the heart of the board lies the Raspberry Pi Foundation's very own RP2040 microcontroller chip. This contains a dual-core ARM Cortex-M0 Plus CPU, which is clocked at up to 133 MHz. Also on the RP2040 is the Pico's 264 kilobytes of RAM. And yes, that's 264 kilobytes, as this is a microcontroller. Next to the RP2040 is a chip containing 2 megabytes of onboard flash storage. This may not sound like much, but it's perfectly sufficient for storing quite a lot of code. Next to the storage chip, we then have a boot selector button, which is used to put the Pico into programming mode. On the end of the board, we find an LED, as well as a single micro USB 1.1 port for transferring programs to the Pico, as well as for powering the board. Power could also be supplied via GPIO pin 39 and a ground pin, such as pin 38, 
with the Pico accepting a 1.8 to 5.5 volt input. I've already started to reference the Pico's GPIO connectors, these 40 pads on either side of the board, and to which we'll be adding some headers later in the video. If we turn the board over, you'll also see that on the back, everything is nicely labeled, that's great to see. And to give you the headlines of the 40 pins we have here, 26 are multifunction GPIO pins, including two UART connectors, two SBI controllers, and two I2C controllers. And we've got 16 PWM channels. So what all this means is that the Pico is great for things like controlling servos, and the SBI and I2C connectors can be used to wire in an LCD display. As noted earlier, the GPIO pins also include three analog inputs, which will return a 12-bit number representing the voltage between 0 and 3.3 volts. It's also worth noting that the Pico has got a non-chip clock as well as a temperature sensor. Although sadly, the Raspberry Pi Foundation didn't manage to include on the board any functionality for making a cup of tea. The Raspberry Pi Pico does not run a full operating system, but can be programmed in several languages, including C and MicroPython. MicroPython is a version of Python written in C and optimized to run on microcontrollers like our Raspberry Pi Pico. So what we're going to do now is to install MicroPython on our Pico, and this can be done using any kind of computer, a Windows machine, a Linux machine, although here, as you can see, I'm using a Raspberry Pi 400, which is running a fully updated version of Raspberry Pi OS. And I've got the USB lead that came in my tin of Pico accessories plugged into the back of the 400. So all I need to do is to take the Pico and to hold down its boot select switch so it boots into programming mode. And then I need to plug in the lead from the Pi like that. And hopefully, if we cross our fingers, there we are. The Pi has picked up the Pico. It is mounted as a drive. And if we click on OK, we will see the Pico in the file manager. And there's a couple of files here, one of which is an index file from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. If we click on that, it takes us out to a web page. It gives us lots of support, not just for the Pico, but for other RP2040 based microcontrollers. Oh, look, we have to tend to get rid of cookies. I wonder how much human time is wasted with us all telling computers we don't mind having cookies, which are obviously we're going to have if we're using the web. Anyway, enough of such matters. Down here, we can see there's lots of useful stuff, including getting started with MicroPython, which we can install via a drag and drop method. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do an even easier method, which is to run up, get rid of that as well. We'll run up Sony. Over in programming here, we've got on the Pi, we've got the Sony pre-installed. And if you're not working on a Pi, you can download it from Sony.org. And when it comes up, you will see down in the bottom right, it tells us that the Python interpreter we're using is currently Python 3.7.3. But if we click on that, with our Pi Pico connected, we can select MicroPython Raspberry Pi Pico. And you'll see what that causes to happen is this dialog to come up because we haven't got MicroPython currently on the Raspberry Pi Pico. So I can click here on Install, and it does the whole thing for us, which is very handy indeed. So it says starting, hopefully it'll sort it out. Should be nice and quick. There we are, that looks rather good. It's done, excellent. And if we close on that, you can see down here in the shell in Thony, we are running Python on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Isn't that amazing? So we could now do something. What should we do? Let's execute print and greetings like that. And there we are. By the magic of computing, we printed the word greetings. And for even more excitement, let's try and turn on the LED down here on the Raspberry Pi Pico, and let's give ourselves a bit more space to uh, do this. There we are, like that. So uh, we need to do three commands for this. First of all, we need to set up the relevant GPIO pin, which is pin 25, permanently connected to the Pico's LED. So we'll do a from machine import pin, like that. And then we'll define LED to be pin 25, as we said, and it's going to be a pin output because we want to control the LED. There we are, it is all now set up. And then finally, if we type LED Pi like that, and hopefully, there we are, we've turned on the LED on the Pico, which is very exciting indeed.
And if we can stand the pace, we can turn it off again with an LED low. And uh, there we are, we're using micro Python commands to control the hardware of the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now, while turning the Pico's own LED on and off may keep us amused, ideally we want to control our own components. And to facilitate this, I'm going to solder on some headers. And many people will take male headers and they'll put them under the board, they'll put them like uh, this over here and like uh, this over there, like that. And the reason they will do things like that is so they can take the Pico and they can plug it into a breadboard. But as you can see, my little breadboard here is too small to have a Pico plugged in the top. And so what I'm going to do is a little bit different. I'm not going to use those male headers. I'm going to use two female headers, which are going to fit on the top of the board like that and like that. That's the configuration I'm going for. So now it's time for me to get out my soldering iron and to do a little bit of soldering. And 40 shiny molten metal connections later, the Raspberry Pi Pico is festooned with two headers. And as you can see, I've also put it onto a small baseboard just to keep it uh, nice and stable. And I've wired it up to five LEDs on this breadboard with appropriate current limiting resistors. So let's connect it to the Pi. We don't have to press down the button this time, we're just connecting it normally to the Raspberry Pi 400. And we'll go across the Pi 400's desktop and we'll launch the uh, Sony editor as we did previously, which will come up hopefully, there we are. And you can see we're connected to the Pico running MicroPython, but if we weren't, we would go down here at the bottom right and we would select the appropriate interpreter. So we might have come in, for example, and found that uh, Sony was using the interpreter Python 373, but if it was on that, we'd just go and select Raspberry Pi Pico, and we'd see we're on the Pico when we get the Pico shell. Anyway, the code I've written here is nice and straightforward just to test things out. Basically, we're importing pin from machine as previously, and we're importing the library uTime, which is a time library which uses the real-time clock on the Pico, as opposed to the library called time rather than uTime, which uses operating system time. And we don't have operating system time here to use. And then setting up five GPIO pins called LED AA to EE for our five LEDs, as you can see. I'm defining a variable called delay. And then we've got an infinite loop, a while true loop, inside which I've got some code that says, turn on the first LED, wait for delay, turn it off, turn on the second, etc. Not the best written piece of code, but it'll work for our purposes testing things here. So if I execute the code, and uh, there we are, we now have a running light operated from the Pico. I do like that. You can't go run with uh, an LED running light, can you? It's, a, it's fantastic to see that working. So that's all very well, but of course what's happening here is we're running with the Pico connected to the Raspberry Pi 400. We really want to run it independently, that's the whole purpose of a microcontroller. So I'll stop the program and I'm going to save this code, not on the Pi 400 where it's saved at the moment, but on the Pico. So I'll click Save As and we'll select not this computer but Raspberry Pi Pico and we're going to call it main.pi. And if you save a Python program on the Pico called main.py, it will auto run. So I can click OK on that. That's all done. I'm now going to close down Thonny, and I'll also disconnect the uh, Pi from the Pico. Greetings. Here I am back again, and I've now got a USB power bank, which I'm going to use to power the Pico. So let's just plug this in down here like uh, that. And then the power bank has got an on switch here. So when I press the on switch, the Pico should boot up and run our main.py code. So let's have a go. And there it is. It works. And this is really what microcontrollers are all about, running a piece of code that controls some electronics. This is this is very exciting. I'm sure some of you are saying, Chris, this is not that exciting. I said, it is. Look, we've got a, a running light. They're always very exciting. Think what Glenn A. Larson did with running light LED characters, like the early Cylons and Kit the Car. He made a whole career out of running light LED characters. And more broadly, of course, this is just a test. This demonstrates the sort of things you can do with a microcontroller, running a piece of code on a board to 
linked to other electronic components. They could be LEDs, it could be servos, it could be sensors, all type of things like that. So this is, I think, a very exciting development in the world of Raspberry pi -dom, the new Raspberry Pi Pico. The Raspberry Pi Pico is the first microcontroller that I've looked at here on Explaining Computers, and it presents all kinds of possibilities in areas like robotics. If you'd like me to look in more detail at the Pico in future videos, or indeed to look at other microcontrollers, do let me know down in the comments section. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.